tend to think that the lack of a government and the lack of laws would create some kind of Mad Max society where people would savagely kill each other. Hollywood certainly helped to shape our thinking about how the abstention of some authority would lead us to total chaos. After all, they have been making a lot of movies with these themes, such as the Wild West, since the beginning of the 20th century. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the Wild West was not that wild. But I'll talk about the Wild West not being wild, maybe in another episode. In this episode, I want to talk about something older and in the old continent. Before the 19th century, before the unification of Italy, in the same region, there were several small countries that existed for several centuries as sovereign nations, such as the Kingdom of Sicily, the Kingdom of Sardinia, the Republic of Genoa, the Republic of Venice, the Papal States, the Republic of Florence and some other realms. But in today's episode, I want to talk about the later Republic of Cuspaia, a small nation that could be considered an example of an anarcho-capitalist society. And the history of this nation will probably surprise a lot of people, as it was nothing like Mad Max. The little nation between the Papal States and the Republic of Florence had no government, it had no laws, no police, no prison, no taxes, and it existed for nearly four centuries, 386 years to be precise, from 1440 to 1826. The birth of the Republic of Cuspaia was caused by a cartographical mistake. In 1431, Pope Eugene IV needed money, and he made a loan of 25,000 florins from Cosimo di Giovanni de' Medici, the famous banker from the neighbour country to the north of the Papal States, the Republic of Florence. Pope Eugene IV put up as a guarantee that he would pay his debt the town of Bolgo San Sepolcro and its surrounding in the upper Tiber Valley. Nine years after, Pope Eugene IV hadn't managed to pay back the loan, and then he had to hand over the town of Bolgo San Sepolcro and its surroundings to Florence. Both parts sent surveyors to set the new frontiers between the two countries, and they had agreed that the new frontier would be real. But the thing is, real means river in Latin, and several rivers in that region had the same name. So, by a huge mistake, the surveyors of the Papal State had chosen one river called Real, and the surveyors of Florence had chosen another river also called Real to set up the frontiers. In between the two rivers, there was a chunk of land, the region of Cuspaia. Cuspaia then became out of the jurisdiction of both Florence and the Papal States. The residents of Cuspaia, even though they were mostly literates, saw that as a great opportunity and declared themselves independent. Both the Papal States and Florence didn't want to renegotiate the frontiers and then, both parts didn't try to integrate Cuspaia into their territories. The mistake by the Papal States and the Republic of Florence became the fortune of the residents of the little hamlet of Cuspaia, and in 1484, the independence of the Republic of Cuspaia was officially recognized. The Republic of Cuspaia had no army, it also didn't have a jail, it also had no arbitrary laws, nor taxes. There was only a simple council of elders composed by the family heads that would meet eventually. They would meet at the Church of Annunciation, where we can still see a sign in Latin written Perpetua et firmas libertas, which means perpetual and firm liberty. This council was not in fact a government, it was summoned only eventually to handle decision making and to handle disputes. Despite having no government and no rules, there are no indicators of Cuspaia being a violent place. Quite the contrary happened throughout its history. It was a place that always attracted people. In the beginning, the economy of the Republic of Cuspaia was mostly based on buying and selling goods and bartering. A lot of people from the surrounding areas were attracted to the country because of the inexistence of taxes, regulations and laws. The citizens of Cuspaia were free to pursue their dreams and to do whatever they found more profitable. They were not obliged to waste their times with duties with lords and kings. They didn't have to risk their lives fighting wars, wars that were only interesting to the nobles, 
and they didn't have to waste part of their labor to enrich the state. With freedom, the citizens of Cuspaya only had benefits. In 1574, the Bishop of San Sepulcro, the neighboring town that triggered the existence of the Republic of Cuspaya, received from his uncle, who was a cardinal in Paris, a gift whose origins were from the New World, tobacco seeds. Tobacco had arrived only a few years ago from the Americas in Europe. It was a fairly new thing for Europeans, and tobacco got quite popular in a very short period of time. Tobacco leaves were used for their medical properties, as they have anti-inflammatory properties, and they were also used for headaches. When dried, the leaves were also used to smoke, to chew, and to snuff. Soon after arriving in San Sepulcro, the tobacco became quite popular in the whole region, and Cuspaya's tobacco became very popular due to its high quality. That happened because the land and the regional weather were very good for the tobacco to grow. In 1624, something regarding tobacco happened. Pope Urban VIII issued a papal bull, that means some papal decree, threatening to excommunicate people that would use tobacco inside the churches. Even though that doesn't seem to be a very significant thing to alter the whole production and consumption of tobacco, how information traveled back then and the impossibility of checking the accuracy of the information made several rumors regarding the possible excommunication to appear, what ended up affecting the tobacco's production and consumption. But not only false rumors regarding the ban inside the church affected the tobacco industry. Other popes that came a bit after Urban VIII's tightened restrictions regarding the tobacco and many places started to impose regulations and even bans to the tobacco consumption and production throughout the time. Especially the papal states in Florence, the two surrounding countries that landlocked the Republic of Cuspaya had regulations or bans regarding the tobacco. But these bans and regulations did not affect the later Republic of Cuspaya. The people from the Republic started to profit a lot from these prohibitions of the neighboring nations, as the Pope didn't rule over Cuspaya. Cuspaya became some kind of tobacco capital thanks to the restrictions of these neighboring countries, and it started to supply tobacco to the whole region, and the best of all, tax-free. The Cuspaese tobacco is still famous, and its cigar, that is still produced, holds a very good reputation amongst cigar smokers. Another point that helped the economy of Cuspaia to flourish was the fact that the little hamlet never discriminated anyone commercially. It was a true laissez-faire hamlet, Historically, the Jewish population has always been targeted by government with sanctions in the surrounding nations. During some periods, the Jews were prohibited of trading with Christians and even forbidden of owning properties, but not in Cuspaya, where they were always allowed to practice their commerce and to own property. Many tobacco warehouses in Cuspaya were owned by Jews from all around the territory that we now call Italy. In the 18th century, Cuspaya managed to resist the invasion of Napoleon Bonaparte, but a bit after Napoleon's campaign was finished and his army was gone from the region, the economic success of the Republic of Cuspaya started to bother the overlords of the neighboring nations that were greedy individuals that simply wanted to get their share of the profits of this Cuspaiesi. The Papal States and Florence didn't want some neighbors selling goods and enriching themselves while they were not getting any money out of that. The Pope Leo XII and the Grand Duke of Tuscany are reported to have been corresponding for a long time about how to take care of Cuspaya and, unfortunately, in 1826 they forced the citizens of Cuspaya to sign the Act of Subjugation, otherwise they would have to face severe consequences. That was the end of an era. Cuspaya was incorporated to the Papal States, and each citizen of Cuspaya was given one silver coin with the image of Pope Leo XII as a compensation for the laws of liberty, and they were allowed to continue growing some limited quantity of tobacco. The inhabitants of Cuspaya would later call this coin Papeto, which means something like the little pope, 
in reference to how little they have received for the loss of their freedom. After a few decades and a terrible bloodbath that happened from 1848 until 1871, the unification of Italy happened. All the sovereign kingdoms and other republics were forced into the new central government, the Italy that we know today. And as Cuspire had already been incorporated to the Papal States, it became part of Italy. Even though the Free Republic of Cuspire came to an end, it can still teach us a lot about self governance in a society. Cuspire is a free, sovereign, anarchist republic that had a free market and private property, existed for 386 years. So, it's not some failed anarcho communist society like CHAS, the Marxist Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone that appeared in 2020 in the US and that lasts about a month and that was marked by violence, lack of organization, and a scarcity of goods. The Free Republic of Cuspire can teach us that voluntarism works, that good ideas don't require force, and that another way of organizing the society is possible. It can teach us that we don't need big governments to live well, nor in peace, that self governance is possible, and that we don't need so many rules and regulations as our overlords like to try to convince us that we need. Especially now in 2020 and on. When the control and the government are bigger than ever, when tyrants obsessed with power and central control are trying to reshape the world we live, perhaps the history of the Free Republic of Cuspire can inspire us to reimagine and reshape the world that we want to live. Even though Cuspire is no longer sovereign and free, the Cuspiesi hold some celebration to honor the history of the Republic of Cuspire. The celebration happens every June. If you're interested in to knowing more about this event, they have a website, repubblicadicuspire.it. There are some interesting videos on the internet, in Italian, about this beautiful party in the charming region where the Free Republic used to be. So, we have reached the end of this episode. If you like this content, share it with your friends and please subscribe to our channels. You can also support us with some donation at our website, libertarianeurope.com. There you can also find a lot of interesting content, not only in English, but also in other languages. 